I am Yudhan Tafami, and I'm Faith today. and this is Busting Grass. We're going to provide for you guys today a case against American law culture, and uh, you know, kind of describe the environmental issues that come with manicured grass in your yards. So, to start with a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, the 1950s, right? The rise of kind of suburbia, the new American dream, right? Everyone wanted the perfect home, the perfect car, and the, you know, the perfect family, 2.5 kids, classic. But most importantly, everyone wanted the perfect lawn. You know, like the greenest grass, the most uniform it could possibly be. And maybe kind of that idea of suburbia as a whole has faded in our culture, but the, the idea of the perfect lawn has absolutely um, like the relationship between nice lawns, reputation, and class has been around for a lot longer than we think. Um, to go back to the 1950s, here's a clip from a magazine in which this man here, dressed in his nice Sunday best, is uh, is rejecting his other pastimes and you know this lovely lady, the love of his life, in order to have a nice lawn. Um, you know, even like the grass beforehand, it looks so nice, right? It looks so green, but he, he prefers to have his grass just fully mowed down, to speak legitimately. And to go a little further back to that, here's a quote from The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which was published in 1925. Um, and this book is famous for its commentary on class roles and social expectations, so keep that in mind when I read this book. So, J. Gatsby, who's like a very rich man in the story, says to his friend Nick, who is not as rich. Uh, I want to get the grass cut. We both looked at the grass. There was a sharp line where my ragged lawn ended, and the darker, well-kept expanse of his began. I, sus I suspected that he meant my grass. And then Gatsby goes on to say, Old sport, you don't make much money, do you? So obviously, this shows the class disparity. Uh, and I'm almost positive that they will put this in the book to show class issues. And to go further back from the 1920s, Here's a screenshot from the American History TV video in which a man dressed up as Thomas Jefferson explains his love of gardening and estate planning at his uh, at Monticello. And this is actually true. Um, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington both really loved the, the landscapes of the wealthy English gentry in their homes. And um, obviously it wasn't Thomas Jefferson doing his own gardening, which you know shows class issues in a different way. But also like land owning and this kind of thing, they were very important, you know, to be able to perform civic duties. So of course you wanted your land to look better than everyone else's land. Um, but there are other reasons, you know. Obviously it's not the fault of the homeowners that this culture has existed for so long, and that the quality of lawn is directly related to reputation. Um, like you know, for example, this house right here, maybe the it's kind of the new American dream in the way like the buzzwords are the same, big house, nice view, and acres and acres of beautiful green grass, but it's new and it's different. And uh, another new thing, um, and you know, something very pleasant in our culture today is economic reasons. Why do people want good lawns? Um, simple lawn maintenance, which includes mowing a lot, pesticides, chemical fertilizers, that kind of thing, that can lead to a 100 to 200% return on investment for your homes. And actually adding turf grass to your lawns can uh, increase the value of your home up to 15%. So obviously the people who have the time and the money and the physical capability to take care of their lawns are going to have better success in the housing market overall and just like in the economy of America. But what about the people who don't have the time and the physical capability to take care of their laws? Well, there are actually municipal lawn care laws, laws in a lot of uh, counties around the country, um, which aren't just being enforced most of the time, but when they are, they are. Um, for example, a woman named Ebony Connor in Illinois in 2016 was arrested for not having the law and was kept in jail for like a few days. And a Florida man in 2019 was charged $30,000 for allowing his lawn to grow over 10 inches. So now we're kind of getting into the tough stuff, right? Why is this actually the problem? Overall, Americans spend $20 billion a year on lawns, and you no, know, probably a lot of us don't spend that much money. So, like, how much money are people who are spending money actually spending? 
Um, this is not sustainable for a lot of Americans. Another fact is that native food grass is the number one crop in America. It's actually three times larger than irrigated corn. And so, uh, and most of this native food grass is centralized in upper class areas like golf courses or Jane Austen novel estates, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and with all of this grass, of course there's going to be a lot of water use, right? So about 67,500 gallons of water are used per American every year. That's per American. And a lot of us, I'm sure, don't really water our lawns that frequently. So how much water are the people who are watering their lawns actually using? Um, and with 35 million families using toxins on their lawns every year, homeowners use 10 times the amount of pesticides uh, that farmers use on their lawns, that farmers use on like, all of their farms. And pesticides have always kind of been a major issue in environmental spaces. For example, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which was published in 1962, which was kind of after the rise of suburban pop propaganda and the types of billboards that I showed earlier, and I can think of one back to the future one. Um, this brought like brought to light issues with DBT, which was like a very uh, harsh chemical and really had detrimental impacts on the environment. But even after all this work and the government's ban on DBT, there's still a lot of work to be done surrounding pesticides. Um, so now we have a history and some introduction to some of the issues, but let's get into some of the more environmental aspects. Like Ada said, up to 10 times more pesticides are used on lawns than by farmers. And we've all heard of pesticides that are used in negative effects, but what do they actually do? Pesticides make, visually, they make your lawn appear to be much healthier than it is, but it doesn't address the issue behind why your lawn is dead. Generally, your grass is having issue from poor soil, maybe the climate, or previous care, um, all of which are not issues that can be solved by using pesticides. In fact, by using pesticides, it generally only disrupts the soil cycle and makes the lawn become dependent on these pesticides, which of course only contributes to more pesticide use, hence the 70 million pounds of pesticides that are used annually. Um, not only does this pesticide use have effect on the environment, but there are also profound effects on the ecosystems and animals in surrounding areas. The insects, for example, maybe bees, are directly affected from this pesticide application. And from there, it can work its way up the food chain. Maybe rodents like mice eat these insects, or maybe they reach into the streams and then fish are affected. And the birds that eat these fish are then affected. Maybe there is chemical leaching on roads which larger animals like bighorn sheep might lick for the salt. So there are quite profound effects on both the environment and animals. Um, another issue is in gas, which is very closely associated with lawn care, maybe rocking or mowing. Um, but 200 million gallons of gas is used annually by Americans on lawns, and that doesn't even include the 15 million gallons that are spilled every year. These gases are obviously disposed of as greenhouse gases, which contribute to larger issues like global warming and damage to ozone layers and leave quite a significant impact on the environment. You can see Boeing has one of the highest emissions of gases, um, but this does not only affect the environment, but humans as well. For example, nitrogen oxide, which is in this gas, is harmful to central nervous systems. Carbon monoxide in these gases can cause heart disease as the chemicals try to replace oxygen in the bloodstream. And um, habitat destruction is also quite a significant issue as well. The idea of implementing a perfect lawn on the lawn makes hundreds of thousands of people every year put trees and bushes and plants and the natural soils out, um, which obviously the animals rely on and depend on for their homes. You can see they go from living in a luscious green forest with plenty of materials to make a home and then suddenly have to find a way to live or are pushed out of their home to in these perfectly striped green lawns, which is not sustainable for them. Um, another issue with this is it also causes a lot of endangerment for animals. On a much larger scale, this is seen with tigers, elephants, and rhinos, but on a more relevant scale to lawn care, um, specifically hedgehogs and turtles are seeing are facing dangerous levels of endangerment and hopefully not, but possibly extinction. Um, Obviously, like Ada said, 67,500 gallons of water are used annually on lawns per American, 
which unsurprisingly is one of the leading causes of droughts. Um, not only is it a leading cause of droughts, but once these droughts are caused, people still find the need to water their lawns. Um, if you look up what to do during a drought for your lawn care, it still says to water your lawns. That's not helpful um, because a lot of this is um, water that once it's used, it creates high demands and pressures on the earth to provide enough, even for basic things like showering and drinking water, when millions of gallons are being used on lawns. Uh, another very common issue is stormwater runoff, uh, which is a major issue in terms of heavily chemicalized lawns. And I'm going to do a little demonstration, so if you'd like to come closer, um, it looks like there's enough seats up front if you would like to. Uh, so let me describe the process a little bit here. So let's say that Bob likes his lawn very, very clean, very neat and organized, he wants it to look healthy, so he uses pesticides. Here go the pesticides. Now, we have pesticides on the lawn, and it looks luscious and green and gorgeous. But now, here comes the storm. Now let's watch what happens as the storm water hits the roof, goes into the gutters, down the gutters, and over the wall. You can probably see that it's going down the gutter, across the lawn. Maybe there is a road there that's carrying, that's got oil spill on it for cars. So it's taking all the pesticides off the lawn. It's getting oils from the roads. It's getting maybe debris on the roads. It's going down into the storm drain, which is just a drain you might see on the side of the road, just a little break. And these drains are often deposited into rivers, lakes, oceans. Maybe this is your reservoir for the town that supplies your water source. And now, when it goes off for treatment, it's got pesticides and oils and all sorts of chemicals on it. Um, so what are some things that we can do about this? You know, we've been talking a lot about the issues that you know, affect the environment, but you're probably wondering what exactly you can do, because you want your lawns to look nice, right? But you also don't want to kill off these animals and uh, destroy your drinking source. So we're going to talk about some uh, some solutions here. And these are the main ones we're going to talk about. We've got your classic rainwater barrels. We've got your permeable surfaces that you can uh, use to build parts of your landscapes. And of course, biodiversity. So you've probably seen rainwater barrels maybe just be driving by, but they're generally just a plastic or wooden barrel that you simply, I'm going to use in this little cup, that you simply put at the bottom of your gutter to collect rainwater. So now let's see what happens when our storm hits. Rainwater goes down the gutter, and you can see, I hope you can see, that it is filling this barrel. Now, our water is handily collected in this barrel. Why is this so helpful? Well, you probably noticed that there was no runoff. None of this water went down the storm drain. Our reservoir didn't fill with more pesticides. Not only that, the water that is now in this barrel can be used to water your lawn. This is fantastic because the water, the rainwater that has natural nutrients is actually much healthier for your lawn than the treated water that has phosphates and nitrogen and chlorine, which is not necessarily helpful for your lawn. It's obviously more cost efficient and more efficient for water because you don't need as much water coming from the hose if you just use rainwater. Um, another great thing that Ada reviewed was permeable surfaces. As you can see, in this case, there's maybe a road or a driveway or a walkway that's collecting the water and just funneling it down into the storm drain. But permeable surfaces, anything that allows liquids or gases to pass through it, will have a much different result. You can see here there's rocks, stone pavers, maybe bricks. There are, I'm going to be using this paper towel. I don't suggest you make your driveway out of paper towels, but for the sake of the demonstration, I'm going to be using paper towel. So there's our permeable surface. We're going to put it down. And now let's see what happens when the storm hits. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but the water is being absorbed onto this paper towel, our permeable surface. And there's still a little bit of runoff that's going into the reservoir, but a lot of it is captured in this towel, which means it is soaking into the ground. Uh, this is really great because it reduces runoff. As you can see, there were much less pesticides being run into our reservoir. It's also fantastic for groundwater because the water that seeps into the ground is now going to be, maybe it goes to an aquifer or a well, which is a drinking source. And um, if you don't use pesticides on your lawn, 
that's absolutely fantastic because now you have perfectly clean water as your well source or your aquifer. Uh, another really important thing that AWP reviewed was biodiversity and reintroducing biodiversity. This is a really crucial aspect of keeping lawns beneficial and healthy for the environment. Um, generally, this just means allowing sections of your lawn that are purposefully not mowed. As you can see, there's maybe walkways or gardens, um, little mowed areas, but around it, there's a lot of bushes and natural things that are just allowed to grow. This is fantastic because it allows cleaner air and cleaner water. Um, and the, an issue with biodiversity is that people tend to use the same aesthetic plants to uh, landscape their houses, which is an issue for other plants because maybe they're destroying habitat destruction, which in turn means that they're not being used, and maybe that leads to their endangerment and extinction as well. So it's really important to allow natural plants to grow. Um, it's also very important to limit, to limit, if not eliminate, the use of pesticides for um, natural soil cycles and to allow the natural plants to thrive. Now we've been talking a lot about what you should do, what you should do, and what a healthy lawn looks like. So I'm going to show you what I think a beautifully healthy lawn looks like. As you can see here, on the side there we've got a little bit of mowing, maybe a little walkway. Possibly the area in this gate is you know, mow for a little play area, but generally for the most part, you can say the majority of this lawn is covered in wildflowers and it's like a little prairie. And in my humble opinion, I think that is absolutely beautiful. Some other lawns that we like, uh, that we think are perfect for the environment look like this. Look at all that, look at all those native plants in that garden. Maybe there's like a little bird that they're perfect for animals and, you know, for biodiversity, like I said. There's also this one, kind of the same deal here. And of course, this. This is a moss lawn, uh, and moss is great for the ground, great for, uh, for the ecosystem of your lawn. Also, they've got a permeable surface walkway here. Like you said, great for groundwater, great for that kind of thing. So these might not look like the most perfect lawns to you guys. This is exactly the type of thinking that we kind of want to change and that we think everyone can work to change. You know, people are already, um, you know, finding wildflowers and more natural looking lawns to be nicer and, uh, and just like prettier in general. So if that makes you feel better. Um, variety of landscaping has already, yeah, already become more and more pleasing to people. And like you said, designating areas for native plants and for higher grass, uh, that's great. It can be in your backyard. No one has to see it. You know, when they're walking by, you can just keep it hidden. But as long as you're kind of um, actively thinking about what you can do for animal habitats and for native plant growth, that kind of thing, you're doing great. You're doing great. So we recommend you know, start thinking actively about the impacts of your family's lawn maintenance. What can you do to lead to the sustainability of your lawns? If you want to keep them around for a long time, if you want to keep animals around for a long time, or plants around for a long time, um, think about every time you mow your lawn, how often do you do it? Or what kind of pesticides do you use? That kind of thing. Um, or, you know, maybe you don't even have to think about it. Just tell your dad. Tell your dad to stop mowing his lawn every few days. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, thank you. Thank you.